Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to um, uh, CSIS. Thank you all for coming on a very rainy, on a very rainy uh, day. Um, <clears throat> and um, I want to welcome you to something that we call Korea Going Forward, which is a uh, series of events that CSS, CSIS has done in the run-up to the visit of uh, President Park to Washington um, in a couple of weeks. Uh, in June, we held a public conference uh, where we looked at Korea's global role uh, as well as uh, the future of the six-party talks, and we brought all of the, or, or most of the former six-party negotiators in uh, for that. Uh, the past few weeks, we've been doing some briefings uh, for our friends and partners um, with the State Department uh, about the visit of President Park, and today, uh, uh, our Korea Going Forward event will focus on uh, Northeast Asian cooperation, uh, the concept of NAPSI, which is the Northeast Asian Peace and Cooperation Initiative of President Parks, as well as the pivot or the rebalance uh, to Asia. Um, next week, we'll be doing a CSIS presser in advance of President Park's visit, and then, of course, uh, on October 15th, um, CSIS has the uh, great honor of being able to host President Park for her uh, one public policy address while she'll be here uh, meeting with President Obama. Um, the, uh, the agenda for today is a compact one. We're trying to do this all so that we can get you out before the hurricane hits um, later this afternoon. Uh, we'll start with some welcoming remarks for Ambassador Ahn. Uh, then we'll begin with a broad strategic look at the region by um, our President John Hamry and uh, Dr. Uh, Brzezinski. Uh, then we'll drill down a little deeper uh, with a panel of experts from the United States, from Korea, from Japan, and from China on Northeast Asian cooperation uh, and the summit. Then we'll feed you with some lunch, uh, and then we'll have another panel discussion about Northeast Asian peace and cooperation, the NAPSI concept. Um, uh, but before we begin, um, I uh, would like to offer this uh, safety notice. Um, CSIS, at CSIS, we take our safety very seriously, and um, uh, we, feel we feel very secure in our building, but as a convener, we feel it's our responsibility to prepare you for any eventuality. Um, I will serve as your responsibility safety officer at this event. Uh, there should be um, uh, cards on your table that give you uh, the layout of, the, uh, of, the, of this uh, particular facility. Uh, but uh, just familiarize yourself with the emergency exits. There are three directly behind you, and there are three behind these walls. Um, <clears throat> um, and so, did I do that right, boss? I think I got that right. So, so uh, thank you, uh, thank you very much. So, also before we begin, I want to give a special thank you to our partners and sponsors for Korea going forward, uh, Grosvenor Capital Management. Uh, Amcor Technology, Friends of the CSIS Korea Chair, and of course, Korea Foundation. With, uh, without their support uh, and without their help, uh, the Korea Going Forward series would not be uh, possible. So to begin, it's really my distinct pleasure to uh, uh, welcome Ambassador An Ho Young um, to the stage. He is a, um, the Republic of Korea's ambassador to the United States. He's had a 37-year, very illustrious career in the foreign ministry. Previously, previously served as the first Vice Foreign Minister, was head of the Korean mission to the European Union, and was, of course, a G8 and G20 Sherpa uh, for Korea. Um, most importantly, he's a graduate of the two best universities in Korea and the United States. Um, that is uh, Seoul National University and, of course, Georgetown University here in Washington, D.C. So, uh, so with that, Amb Ambassador Ron, thank you so much for joining us. Maybe you could offer some welcoming remarks. Good morning. No response? Good morning. All right. Well, some of you have already heard me saying this, which is that uh, every day I come to CSIS is a great day for me. So this is a great day. So this morning, when I was coming to CSIS, then I was saying, this is another great day. And then I added another phrase, which is rain or shine. Right. <laughs> Rain or shine is a great day for me. 
But there are at least three reasons why I think this is a three more reasons. Right? Chris, you already know, knew that, right? I know we written one, two, three, and let's get rid of Exactly. Exactly. So there are at least three more reasons why I think this is a great day. First of all, today we are discussing about Korea at the CSIS. And then I'm Korean ambassador to Washington, D.C. And then, of course, it gives me great pleasure that we are discussing about Korea at one of the best, or the best think, think tank in the whole world. So that's the first reason. Second, the first program we have today, that, of course, is spotlight debate between President John Henry and Dr. Brzezinski. And these are two gentlemen who, who who do not need any introduction anywhere in the world, especially in Washington, D.C. But at the same time, yesterday, I had the pleasure of chatting with Dr. Brzezinski. And one of the things I told him was one of the books Dr. Brzezinski wrote many decades ago. And that book, I'm pretty sure many of you would, would have already read it. There is a book called uh, The Grand Chessboard. I think many of you have already read it. And uh, when I told him, I read it many decades ago when Dr. Brzezinski wrote it. But at the same time, over summer, I had an opportunity to, to read it once again. That's what I told Dr. Brzezinski. And then he turned to me, and then he said, do you think the book is still relevant today? That was the question raised by Dr. Brzezinski to me. And my answer was, well, Many decades ago, when I first read it, I thought it was a very relevant. And I, when I read it once again in summer, I said to myself, somehow it became even more relevant. So if you are interested in uh, geopolitics at all, then I strongly recommend that you read it. So that, in fact, is the second reason why I'm very excited about today. And then the third reason is because Victor has already said it, because one of the issues we are going to discuss today is, of course, NAPSI. And NAPSI, I'm telling you this second time after Victor. Victor has already given you what NAPSI stands for. That's Northeast Asia Peace Cooperation, Cooperation Initiative, Peace and Cooperation Initiative. And, of course, my president would be coming to Washington, D.C. sometime soon, on the 16th. And this is something she has been proposing as an initiative since day one as president of the Republic of Korea. And this proposal, or this initiative, started from her observation, which is there is a very interesting phenomenon taking place in Northeast Asia, which is economically the relations among countries in Northeast, Northeast Asia. When I say countries among Northeast Asia, then of course it includes the United States, because it is not geographically, it is not part of the United States, but offshore, it is part of, part of Northeast Asia. So when I say countries in Northeast Asia, definitely it includes the uh, United States as well. So there is much economic cooperation going on among countries in Northeast Asia. But somehow, it is not improving other relationships among countries in Northeast Asia. Territorial disputes and historical disputes and narrowly defined nationalism, all of them are unnecessarily making the interstate relationship difficult among Northeast Asian countries. That's an observation being held, being made by a large number of people around the world. But at the same time, my president was of the view where if you have that observation, which she often calls as Asia paradox, if you have that observation, why not do something? And that something in the idea of President Park was NAPSI, Northeast Asia Peace and Cooperation Initiative. And what she wishes to do through that initiative is, and in fact, she's of the view, one of the reasons why we are having unnecessarily strained interstate relationship in Northeast Asia is because of lack of habit of cooperation. So why not come up with certain issues on which we could begin meaningful habit of cooperation among countries in Northeast Asia. One example, of course, would be nuclear safety. Why? Because more than 25% of nuclear reactors in the whole world, they in fact are concentrated in three countries in Northeast Asia, Korea, 
Japan, and China. Another example would be uh, health. Common work on in how to deal with the endemic. The reason being, there are so many highly populated cities in Northeast Asia, again in Korea, Japan, and China. So that, that will be another example. So we have already tried it in the sense that last year when we had Nuclear Security Summit, we in fact organized on the margin of Nuclear Secu Security Summit uh, a meeting among countries in Northeast Asia focused upon, upon how to improve nuclear security, nuclear safety. And then we did it once again, all in September, when we had the second meeting of GHSA, Global Health Security Agenda. And then the first meeting, of course, was held in Washington DC last year. And second meeting was held in Seoul. And on the margin of GHSA, we held a meeting among those countries focused upon how to uh, more effectively deal with endemic in our part of the world. So they are the examples of uh, what uh, we are trying to do under this broad initiative called NEPSI. But at the same time, I, in fact, need not go into all, all, into all those details. Why? Because it is going to be discussed by one of the best panels we can get in Washington, D.C., as well as anywhere in the world. So without any further ado, let me thank you for being here today, and then let me just give the floor to two of the best academics we have uh, in Washington, D.C., as well as uh, anywhere in the world. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Ambassador An, for that uh, introduction. Um, uh, it really is a pleasure to have everybody with us today for this very uh, special conversation. We even gave it a name. We called it a spotlight, a spotlight conversation. Um, as Ambassador An said, these gentlemen need no introduction, but let me just briefly do the justice of introducing them. As you all know, Dr. Brzezinski is a CSIS counselor and trustee here, and he also chairs co-chairs the advisory board. Um, we all know him as the National Security Advisor to President Carter. Uh, he was also awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom for his role in normalization of US-China relations and for his contribution to human rights and national security policies of the United States. Dr. John Hamry is President and CEO of CSIS. Uh, he holds the Pritzker Chair, and he's also Director of the New Brzezinski Institute of Geostrategy. Uh, and again, as you all know, he served as the 26th U.S. Deputy Secretary of Defense. Um, <clears throat> so I want to thank both of you gentlemen for, uh, for joining us this morning. And um, we'll have plenty of time in the other panels to discuss many elements of uh, uh, so-called NAPSI and, and um, uh, Northeast Asian peace and cooperation. But it seems to me that one of the key elements of any discussion or prerequisite for any discussion of Northeast Asian peace and cooperation is the relationship between the United States and China. Um, in many ways, it's uh, not just a necessary, but, a, uh, but not just a, um, uh, an important, but a critical condition when we think about um, security in the region. And we've just come off the visit of President Xi here uh, to the United States. I thought. We could begin, maybe start, John, with you and ask, so where do you think we are in the U.S.-China relationship after uh, the visit of President Xi, and what do you see as the key strategic challenges in terms of this relationship going forward? Well, it's pretty embarrassing to go before Dr. Brzezinski on that question. I mean, <laughs> he's the world's expert. Uh, uh, I thought the visit was okay. I don't think it was a brilliant visit. Uh, I think it... Uh, uh, it dealt with some important issues, both sides, well, some important issues. I don't think that it chartered huge new breakthroughs, but, uh, but having a good visit is important in a relationship, and it was a good visit. Um, 
the, the central unfinished business, it seems to me, is that I think the Chinese now know that they cannot organize Asia in a way that excludes the United States. And the United States couldn't possibly organize Asia in a way that would contain China. Uh, so we know that, but we don't know how to organize our relationships and still give a full basis of participation for everyone else in Asia. Uh, the great power relationship that the Chinese talk about basically assumes the two of us will organize Asia and tell everybody else what to do. And of course, that's not possible. So I think the unfinished business is trying to develop a, re a relationship between us that fully incorporates everyone else in Asia. And of course, the reason that's so hard is um, everyone in Asia wants to have good and proper working relations with China, but they want America there for a security hedge. And it's how do we reconcile that? I think that's the unfinished business of this presidency, and it'll be the work of the next presidency. Okay. Dr. Brzezinski, no, there's probably nobody in this room or in this hemisphere that um, has dealt more intimately with the U.S.-China relationship than yourself. Um, uh, I mean, how, where do you think this relationship is going? It's certainly come a long way, but where do you think it's going uh, you know, after this recent visit and given all the issues that the U.S. and China have in the region and around the world today? I think the evolution of that relationship, which so far has been pretty good over the years, mm -hmm. um, depends on two factors. One, internal affairs in these countries. How stable are they? Do they produce conditions more susceptible to accommodation or towards antagonism, extremism, uncertainty? On balance, I would say, in both countries, the rising domestic difficulties, which make the management of foreign policy increasingly difficult. But in neither country are there enormous pressures in direction of hostility and conflict. So the risk here politically is stalemates, confusions, uncertainties. In a larger sense, I think we also have to take note of the fact that there are right now three places in the world which are sort of uncertain and predictable. So everything is comparable. In Europe, we have a serious problem with the Russians over Ukraine. Whatever your position on it is, the fact is this is a dangerous collision, already partially violent and pregnant with the possibility of being spreading itself uh, more widely. Georgia is in some risk. That means immediately Azerbaijan is in some risk. So we have these problems that are dynamic. In, in the Middle East, of course, we have what's going on right now. Russian military intervention, which seems to be not very clearly defined in its purpose, which has already manifested itself in a strange way, namely attacking assets which are not necessarily strictly limited to alleged enemies, but overlap with some commitments that we have made. And that could lead anywhere. But it's also potentially a very vulnerable undertaking by the Russians because they're operating in a setting in which their point of departure for military action, supplies, ships, ports, airfields, are far from Russia, separated from Russia, and if Bush came to shove, would place Russia in an uncomfortable position. Well, nothing like that exists in the Far East, mm -hmm. except for one thing, and presumably we'll be talking more about that, namely, what will uh, the most recent uh, manifestation of a royal tradition in, in North Korea, the leader of the country you know, who inherit, inherits in a dynastic fashion political power, what will he do regarding some tests of weapons? 
Mm. How far will he go? That's it. That's a situation over which we have very little control and regarding which we have to plan closely with our most immediate ally in the Far East, with whom we have no basic disagreements on any fundamental issues, namely Korea. Mm. Um, so we have to be ready for something of this sort. But I think we can keep the situation under control because of the overwhelming disparity in the availability of force if push came to shove. So I look forward to the president's visit here and to a constructive discussion viewing her and her country as perhaps the least controversial and yet one of the closest allies of the United States. We have some disagreements of a secondary tertiary nature, but we don't really have any fundamental disagreements with South Korea, like we do have with some friends. We have some problems with some of our other Asian friends. So I'm looking forward to the visit with optimism, provided we ourselves are prepared to act intelligently and with restraint and realize that immediate reactions to international problems do not always produce the most successful policies. Mm -hmm. And we have to bear that in mind, particularly in terms of what is happening elsewhere, mm -hmm. Middle East, Europe. Mm -hmm. thank, um, thank you. Um, you mentioned the, um, uh, the, the difficulty of controlling a country like North Korea. I want to ask both of you from the um, perspective of China. I mean, how much do you think China's policy on the Korean Peninsula is changing. How much do you think the view either on North Korea or on South Korea is changing? John? Well, uh, I don't think that China's strategic interests or goals have changed. But I do think that they've changed the modalities of, of trying to achieve those goals. I think they are, they have seen that North Korea can create a lot of problems for them. I think the lesson the, the Chinese drew from the North Koreans when they attacked South Korea and sunk the Chunan mm -hmm. was that that was, that was just as much an attack against Beijing. I mean, because it substantially complicated their political goals in the region. So I think, I don't think their strategic interests have changed. I think they would like to see North Korea evolve. I think they're deeply frustrated at the resistance uh, in North Korea to adopt changes that they know they need to take. Uh, but I don't think they're going to push North Korea into an untenable political situation. Mm -hmm. I think they will, they'll, they will hold back from that. And uh, but but they are but their modalities of have changed. It's you know it's startling to me that uh, President Park has been received quite positively in Beijing, and Kim Jong Un can't get an invitation. Mm. I mean that tells you something. I mean that is a different world. But again, let's not confuse modalities of diplomacy with strategic interests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, uh, Dr. Brzezinski, I mean, to what extent, I mean, again, you have been a part of the, um, the shaping of the U.S.-China relationship for many years. I mean, to what extent, you, there are many issues that the U.S. and China uh, have difficulty on, but to what extent do you th see North Korea as being an issue that the United States and China could potentially cooperate on, whether it's in response to something they do or in the long term in terms of the future of the peninsula? Well, I think, in a rel relatively speaking, that's an easy question to answer. It is to make certain that the, China, the, the North Koreans do not do anything that provokes military conflict, mm. particularly by the utilization in some fashion, even if only demonstratively, of increasingly advanced weaponry of mass destruction. Mm. I think the Chinese are generally concerned about that because they know that the consequences of that could be far-reaching and also particularly so in terms of Japanese reactions. Mm. It could push the Japanese over the limit on what 
the Chinese could view as adequate, mm -hmm. appropriate, mm -hmm. acceptable. So that is the risk. But beyond that, we're dealing actually with a region which, save for one issue, namely the possibility of serious misconduct by a relatively secondary power, except in one domain, the atomic, is the issue. The Chinese have, on the whole, lowered the threshold of confrontation with the Philippines, with the Vietnamese, with the Indians. There are frictions, there are disagreements, there are resentments, but it's not what was some time ago. The Chinese problems increasingly are domestic, mm -hmm. and they do bear on China's ability to operate as a major power, and that is a source of concern. Among the domestic problems, there are some hints of tension between uh, not on the top level individuals or clusters of individuals, but perhaps between the party and its role in China and the significance, increasing significance of the military establishment, as China is now one of the major players in the world. And these are things which are very difficult and sensitive, and I think the Chinese are making every effort to handle them. The relationship with us is kind of twofold. It's cooperative, but it really doesn't cross the threshold to an alliance. Mm. And, and I think personally, it's in their interest, and certainly in our interest, that we do move further towards some sort of an alliance. Mm because the world itself, the international system itself, is becoming increasingly unstable. And an America and China that are drifting apart or are feuding is a counterproductive um, reality in that context, whereas closer American-Chinese coordination on foreign policy issues mm -hmm. uh, could be quite productive. On this, the Chinese are being very cautious. Could, may I just, uh, uh, I absolutely agree with what you said, uh, Dr. Brzezinski, and in that context would like to voice my worries about how the island building issue is evolving. Um, I think that, I, I think the, the Chinese understand that their legal claim with the nine dash line is a very weak argument, a very weak claim. Um, and it would not meet a test uh, in any objective international venue. Mm -hmm. So it appears to us that, that what they're doing is they're laying the foundation for arguing that the islands are not a, a maritime issue, they're a territorial issue. These are territorial waters and they're really subject to domestic Chinese law and that the law of the sea has no bearing and is not relevant to them. Um, if it goes down that road, then we have an unreconcilable problem over the islands. We, you know, we, we will never see these as being the territory, as territorial waters like Hudson's Bay, mm. you know, where it's surrounded by China. I mean, this is not Hudson's Bay. Uh, these are waters that uh, are, are claimed legitimately by uh, five, six countries. And, and so if we move down that road, that becomes, that means that the island building issue becomes an unresolvable issue. And so I do think there's some concern over the next year that we find a way to put this into a constructive path. Because I absolutely agree with what Dr. Brzezinski said that uh, if we're on a path of tension and hostility with China, everything gets worse. So we do have to find a solution to this. Let me add a comment to this. I agree. I agree, but I am also concerned that we have to be very careful not to make that a central issue I agree with that. in our relationship. I agree with that too. And let me elaborate on why. First of all, because of the reasons you've mentioned, which are important. But secondly, we do something to the Chinese every week that I don't think 
we would like them to do to us. And I'm sure most of you know what I'm referring to. But for the one or two or three ignoramuses in the room, let me clarify. <laughs> uh, every week, we fly air missions right on the edge of Chinese territory. Would we like it if there were uh, Chinese planes flying right next to San Francisco or Los Angeles? Uh, this is a serious problem. We have our naval ships going very close to Chinese territorial waters. Why? Because that's an arrangement we had when we recognized Formosa, Taiwan, as a legitimate government of China. And while we no longer do, for realistic reasons, and I was deeply involved in that shift, which had the benefit of creating an opening for the kind of warm, comprehensive relationship we now have with the Chinese, which at one point even involved an alliance, de facto, secretly against the Russians, I do feel that it is a little antiquated, a little un one-sided. And I could see that also producing mm -hmm. some very serious incident, very serious incident. So that yep. these kind of secondary issues have nonetheless enormous psychological and political importance. And I would hate to think what might be the massive political reaction within China if there was some incident mm -hmm. which produced loss of life, as it once almost did. And primarily, let's say, in that case, most of the Chinese involved rather than our people, mm -hmm. simply because that's the way the accident turned out. So we do have some elements here which need to be monitored, but that's too mild even a statement. I do think that we ought to somehow or other put that in a larger package in which both sides ask themselves seriously and responsibly, is it possible that we are doing something that's unnecessarily provocative to the Americans? Are we doing something that it is unnecessarily provocative to the Chinese? Because within the context of this larger cooperation with the Chinese, there is the risk of a sudden event galvanizing latent anti-sentiments, respectively, mutually. And we could plunge into something like that, look at some of the comments in Congress about the Chinese these days. And they could easily plunge into something yeah. similar for other reasons yeah. towards us. Um, very interesting. The, um, uh, the argument about sort of a carefully coordinated managed relationship between the United States and China, United States and China, I think resonates well in the region of Asia because I think most of the countries in Asia don't want to see conflict between the United States and China and they don't want to ever be put in the position where they have to choose between the United States and China. On the other hand, there's always this concern that if the relationship gets too close, then there are lots of insecurities that emerge about the strategic value of these other countries, the allies of the United States in Asia to the United States. So let me ask both of you the question, that, and I'm, uh, sort of what, what is the, how, how do you assess the strategic value of the U.S.-Korea relationship for, for the United States in Asia? So. Well, again, this, uh, this gets to the central conundrum uh, that I mentioned. We, we have not yet figured out our relationship with China in a way that fully and fairly accommodates all of the interests right. of, of Asia. And then we come to a very important key partners uh, like Korea. I, I, to your, directly to your question, Victor, I mean, I, I personally believe that Korea is the, uh, is the most important security partner we have and is the key to whether the region is stable and peaceful or, uh, or becomes unstable and potentially violent. And the reason I say that is neither China nor Japan can afford to let Korea be the other guy's ally. You know, I mean, it's just, Korea has, is uh, too important regionally 
and uh, and Korea is now becoming a, a global power. You know, I mean, it, it Korea continues to think of itself as a regional power, but it's the eleventh largest economy in the world. I mean, it, it it tends to think of itself in small ways. It shouldn't, but on a regional basis, it is a huge power, and it cannot. Um, it, neither of these two big neighbors, Japan or China, can let Korea be the other guy's closest best friend. And yet, Korea has to be strong and independent. Uh, and I think that that comes from a perpetual alliance with us. So I, I think our relationship with Korea going forward is the cornerstone of a peaceful Northeast Asia. No, no, thanks. That's very well said. Dr. Brzezinski, can I, um, um, we're running out of time, so I'm going to ask you two questions at once, and it's really to get, try to help us think about Europe and Asia, uh, if, if, if that's okay. The, um, the first is, so this conference is about uh, uh, Northeast Asian peace and cooperation. We'll, dr we'll drill down into the details of this later, this morning and afternoon, but when you sort of think about the history of regional integration and cooperation in Europe, um, and you think about Asia, you know, what are sort of the, 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 the drivers that you see in Europe that we need to see in Asia, or is Asia completely different in that sense, in terms of achieving uh, the sort of regional cooperation um, that folks aspire to? Um, what, are, what are some of the drivers in Europe yes, that the yes. Asians should look at? Yes, yes. Well, the drivers in Europe right now have a, have a sobriety problem. <laughs> and that seems to me a key issue. You know, Europe is something extremely desirable, and the European unification was a giant step forward in terms of European history. But is it capable of responding to crises mm. and to dealing, them, dealing with them on the sort of basis of the European unity? I think that is a test that's taking place, and the outcome is far from clear. Mm. Um, so I'm not sure Europe is a very good example yet. Hopefully it will be. Um, otherwise, I would say that probably the situation in Asia, save for the problem of North Korea, is strategically more stable mm. than the one in Europe because the one in Europe involves really potentially very dangerous points of vulnerability in Ukraine, in the Baltic republics, not only vis-a-vis -vis NATO members, but non-members like, for example, Sweden. Uh, and now there is this strange pattern of behavior in which uh, Russians are using force in the Middle East in effect somewhat against us, and perhaps even deliberately against us in terms of choice of targets, but from points of very high vulnerability. Just look at the map. Mm -hmm. How are the Russians operating in the Middle East? They literally are operating in an area which is not directly open to them. They have to have the cooperation of the Turks to let them come in. Mm -hmm. And it's far away from immediate sources of supply. Uh, I would think that our military are probably just salivating at the opportunity of cutting off that Russian contingent, contingent, which is sitting on the shores of Syria and has a port or two for its use, and then let them just sit there. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think Asia on the whole, militarily, is not to me a source of great concern, except one single factor which seems to be very much connected with the question of leadership in Korea. I have no idea, I'm not a great expert in Korea, and you can tell us instantly, does the present head of the Korean state have a grown up kid? Mm. Mm. Does it? No. <laughs> yeah, what, what's the age of the kid? Uh, he's 30, 31. He's not. No, uh, no, of, of, his, of, his, of his. Oh, he, no, he, he doesn't have a. He doesn't have he a, a, he has a He has a yes. so daughter. So even a small the baby daughter. Even the yeah. dynastic yeah. problem is wide open. So, in one way or another, that issue is going to surface. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And we don't know what the consequences will be. Perhaps the experts on Korea have a better notion or at least stronger instincts about it. But the country could plunge into a significant dis internal disorder. Mm -hmm. Maybe the military would seize power. Mm -hmm. Well, if the military seizes power, the military is probably motivated much more by military considerations yeah, and nationalism. So it's not necessarily clear that they would necessarily strive to seize South Korea. Perhaps that would be the basis for some eventual resolution of that problem. Because there's no doubt, in my mind at least, that the dynastic issue right now is the major impediment. And maybe even also the major source of excessive ambitions on the part of those in Pyongyang who make policy. And that's particularly the maximum leader. Yeah. So in that narrow respect, it's fluid. But other than that, I don't view Asia right now as a source of major international risks for the international community as a whole, in contrast to the Middle East mm -hmm. and in contrast to Europe. Mm -hmm. right. Well, it's very good to have that perspective. Could I, it, uh, we'll, we'll have time for just a couple of questions, but could I ask you, since you talked about the problem of the dynastic su um, succession, um, how do you feel about the unif unification? I mean, we, you see it as something as we saw in Germany, or do you, do, you, do you, and what sort of impact it would have on the region and stability in the region? Well, I think if it came about peacefully, as the German one did, it would work out, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Obviously, such a peacefully unified Korea would oscillate still towards the West because of economic considerations and the kinds of economic ties that South Korea has developed and which would then become the economic ties of a united Korea. Mm -hmm. um, now, if it erupted into a new civil war, it would be, I think, a source of concern because of the possibility that they do have nuclear weapons that are, in most likelihood, susceptible to being promptly used. Mm -hmm. uh, they haven't really tested them. We don't know precisely what, but it certainly is clear that they're close to being able to use nuclear weapons. And that, of course, introduces a potential disastrous dimension into the Korean problem. But short of that, I think, generally speaking, at this moment, to me, the problems that we have been confronting in Asia, such as, for example, an Indian-Chinese uh, conflict, uh, Indian-Pakistani conflict, uh, Chinese-Russian conflict, as was the case during the Russian invasion of Afghanistan, they seem to have receded. Mm -hmm. right. OK, we'll take a couple. We don't have a lot of time. So we'll take a couple of questions from the uh, audience. Uh, we'll go with Chris first. You got a microphone. It's no, coming. She's coming right uh, now with a mic, Chris. Uh, thanks. Uh, Chris Nelson, Nelson Report. Fabulous discussion. Uh, you violated Ambassador An's three points rule, though, so many things. Thank you. Um, Dr. Brzezinski, you said something that really caught my attention, uh, and maybe I misunderstood it, uh, but you made a point of talking about Formosa. I'm sorry? You made a point of mentioning, uh, of say, uh, using the term Formosa uh, to discuss possible tensions. and our, uh, Normally, uh, uh, these days, we would t more likely to say Taiwan. And I'm wondering, where did you have in your mind um, a possible uh, coming crisis of U.S. policy and China policy uh, uh, with the apparent uh, coming victory of uh, Tsai Ing-wen and the DPP in Taiwan? Or did I misunderstand what you were talking about? I'm not sure. Well, I, I, think, I think he's trying to put you into a trap. Yeah. By, <laughs> because purely you used the term question. Formosa, which reflected your historic experience when, when you were dealing with those issues when you were in government, he's trying to make a trap for you to say that you, by using Formosa <laughs> now, you're making a hidden statement about your views about... So I think you should ignore this question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not aware of the fact I used the word. 
Did I really use the word? Yes, you used Formosa, but that's all right. That's so just disgusting. ignore his question. You're going to be a lot better. If you my do. tongue ought to be funny. Well, it, it, <laughs> it, it, with, with, could I amend my impertinent question that with, uh, uh, let's try uh, with the real bottom line. Uh, obviously, we've got an election coming up. Uh, we, given your very interesting and important comments about the U.S.-China relationship and finding ways to work with each other without making each other enemies, uh, obviously, Taiwan, uh, formerly Formosa, has always been a, a, a difficult issue. When you were national security advisor, it was enormously difficult. How do you see the possibilities for uh, either U.S.-China discord or cooperation with the apparent upcoming re return to power of the DPP on Taiwan? Thank you. Well, I think it depends very much on what happens uh, on mainland China. If mainland China continues in spite of the present uh, circumstances, to become more and more prosperous, uh, socially more satisfactory, politically more flexible. I think there is going to be at some point some movement in the direction of closer ties between Taiwan and the mainland. In already now, the number of civilians, private people, who travel back and forth is very, very high. Uh, the number of Taiwanese who retire around Shanghai and continue doing business there and so forth is significant. Uh, I think the sense of Chinese identity is strong in both places. I think if that continues, then there's going to be inevitably some movement towards further ties, maybe special status, uh, but I don't think that an independent, separate uh, state on Taiwan recognized by a certain number of states internationally is the permanent solution. But that presumes a very successful and stable pattern of development within China. And I think in the more immediate future, there are some questions or some issues uh, to be raised here not by us, but simply in terms of analysis. How is the relationship between the party and the army, the military, evolving? Um, is political control over the military foolproof? Um, what is the role of corruption within different branches of the Chinese government? Uh, is any set of institutions exempt from the virus of corruption. Uh, I think there are legitimate questions to be asked, which the Chinese themselves are asking. And that could be an impediment. Uh, so I think the situation in that respect could move in either direction, but I would not underestimate the power of Chinese nationalism. And if China is successful, and moves forward on all fronts to eminence, potentially preeminence in the foreseeable X number of decades. I think that's going to act as a major impulse also for closer unification. Uh, I am struck by the fact that in the Chinese press, which I try to follow obviously in translation, I don't read Chinese, um, there is more and more emphasis on China as a major power, uh, increasingly open, uh, not covered by the usual uh, qualifications on how backward China is, how it has to overcome its backwardness, and so forth. And there is more of a triumphalist mood in the overall Chinese self-sensitivity. Uh, and if that continues successfully, we are shifting then towards a duopoly worldwide. And let's hope that we can then keep up, because I think some of the problems in this country that have been long visible on the scene are also long overdue for dramatic remedies. And in some cases, they have been dramatically unforthcoming. And I just wonder whether in the longer run, we can operate in the global scene in which we are centrally important but the vast majority of Americans don't have a clue as to what is happening on the world scene. And I mean it quite literally in terms of most Americans have no idea what is happening in the world. And I mean that literally. 
They don't know the names of any, more than probably 10 foreign leaders at most, on average, maybe not many, that many. They have no idea of the problems. They have no idea of the dangers. And that is susceptible to tremendous mistakes. Look at the level of foreign policy discussion in the course of the presidential elections. I mean, they're abysmal. They're shameful. They're dangerous. And that doesn't help us operate on the international scene. And without casting stones, and I have supported President Obama on not deciding to use force because it wasn't very clear against whom that force should have been used in Syria. But uh, I am concerned about a certain sense of kind of intellectual detachment from that issue, uh, which clearly calls for assertive American leadership, although maybe not by just dropping bombs. Great, I think we have time for one more very quick uh, question. Yes. Quick question, quick answer. Yes. So, uh, I believe, Dr. Brzezinski, you mentioned earlier that immediate reactions to international developments don't necessarily make the best Speaking policy. Speaking of the mic, would you have to? Yeah, sorry. You mentioned earlier that immediate reactions to international developments don't necessarily make the best long-term policy. So I want to apply that to North Korea. Ever since the fall of the Soviet Union, the U.S. has sort of vacillated back and forth between isolating and then engaging with North Korea. So moving forward, I want to know what you think about strategic patience or what will be the best policy for how to deal with North Korea? Strategic what, what should be the best U.S. policy for dealing with North Korea? Well, you know, strategic patience is a kind of misleading term. Uh, I'm strategically impatient. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that I want to bomb North Korea or forcibly disarm it. I don't think we have much choice right now vis-a-vis -vis North Korea because a relationship between countries is a two-way street unless you get into war. Then it's a one-way street, I hope, in favor of forward movement rather than the backward movement if we become engaged. In other words, I hope if we become engaged, we win, obviously, very simple. But how to handle a regime which is peculiar in its political arrangements, which requires kind of educated guesses as to whether its leadership is cerebrally stable or unstable, is very difficult. It's extremely difficult. The Chinese have had a much, much closer relationship and many more contacts with the North Koreans than we. And yet when I talk to my Chinese friends who often talk to me quite frankly, <laughs> they seem to be completely bewildered by what's going on and by the people with whom they deal. So I think we're dealing with a situation which is risky simply by the existing arrangements and not by deliberation. I don't think the North Koreans are setting out the liberty to make world issues more difficult or to bring war closer. But there is a peculiarity to their arrangements which produces bursts of emotion, of anger, of threatening, and then pulling back, and then trying to reestablish some of the tenuous economic links that have been useful to North Korea, you know, the joint enterprises and so forth. It's all kind of... Uh, spontaneous and short range. And that therefore is unpredictable and I am serious when I ask, because I don't follow these questions long enough and my asking shows how little I know, what is actually the, the dynastic situation in the country? Because for the last X number of years, leadership has been based on a kind of dynastic principle. Yeah, and that has become somewhat ingrained in the institutions and probably in some of the people involved who expect it. Although one particular case, an uncle who expected too much, hmm. was put to death hmm. by the nephew. Uh, so I don't know what are the dynastic uh, arrangements. You know probably. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. it, and, and seriously, are there relatives, prominent relatives that could then become the next? Not really. No, yeah, so they would have really. to invent yeah. the new device. Yeah. My guess would be, looking at it from outside, it would be somebody from the army. Hmm. Yeah. And that's certainly been the history of the peninsula in yeah. the past. So. Um, 
Um, well, really a fascinating discussion, uh, Dr. Brzezinski, Dr. Hamry. Thank you so much for um, um, starting us off this morning. We really appreciate it, and uh, we look forward to having you back on this stage with us again in the, in the near future. Thank you again.